true servants who are yielded to him. It was also a great time as we met another new family who is going to be a very needy or going to a very needy country in Asia. It always amazes me how God stirs many to serve him in so many places. Praise the Lord, the pastor also informed us that they would be taking us on for support at the end of the conference. Following this conference, we headed to Tallahassee, Florida for a Sunday morning and evening service with the church there. The pastor gave us the opportunity to present the mission field of Siberia and preach the message in the evening service. It was a wonderful day of fellowship. The church voted to partner with us that night. After packing up in Florida, we hit the road to eastern Iowa. We had the privilege to share about the lost in Siberia with the folks at this church midweek service, and again, the pastor here graciously gave me the opportunity to preach. They voted to support us at the end of the service. Praise the Lord. Another blessing was that they were having men soul winning the very next day, which I was blessed to be able to join. This church hosts a large-scale Christmas production with live animals. It was time to begin informing the neighborhood of that and the good news of Jesus Christ. Next up was a missions conference to Nebraska. This was a great reunion for us as we had the opportunity to present and report to a church that has supported us since the early days of our deputation. We truly thank the Lord for allowing us to build close friendships with so many churches and pastors along the way. Praise the Lord, this is another church we have been able to watch grow over the past couple of years, and now they are outgrowing their building. Lastly, we drove to Topeka, Kansas area to present the need of the gospel in Siberia with another church. This church also supports our friends whom we will uh, serve alongside in Russia. It was a great time of encouragement. Two other churches were, uh, where we had been just a couple of months ago also called during October to let us know they were taking us on for support. God is so good. Our visa applications have been submitted along with other necessary documentation and we are awaiting approval. Please pray with us for this all to be approved, which will be a major step toward getting to the mission field. And so he gives some prayer requests here. Uh, pray for God to keep the door of ministry open to Russia. Secondly, peace to be reached in Eastern Europe. Thirdly, our visa applications to be approved. And fourthly, God to guide our way as we find the remaining, uh, remaining uh, support that they need. So that is Xavier and Felicia. So be in prayer for those things. Nice thing about prayer letters gives you an uh, elongated understanding of what their needs are and what God is doing. And also you can just look at those prayer requests. So this is a reminder. I don't say a lot about it. We have a missions display in the foyer. We always place three letters of different missionaries. We change it up every once in a while. But those are there for you to take so that you can look at special needs of missionaries and get an opportunity to pray. So please feel free on the second shelf of the little cabinet there are the letters. I, I really encourage you to take them so that when you pray for the missionaries, you can go a little bit further than saying, Lord, just bless and use them. You can pray for specific needs. And obviously, just as we've been praying for the Torrell family, uh, this family there in Iraq where the husband was martyred, uh, people need specific prayer we have on the back of our prayer list a number of missionaries with physical needs. So as you take your prayer list tonight, we'll just look at that again. Uh, a good report that Beth Bennett, who had a tear in her aorta, not only survived it, but she is doing pretty well. And uh, they put us, they, after the repair, they put a stent into the aorta, and she is doing much, much better. Uh, we continue to pray for the child's. Uh, he has two relatives, Harold and Tori, that both have cancer. And then always pray for his health. He was beaten severely and uh, several, well, a couple years ago. And uh, kidney damage, eye damage, we need to continue to pray for him. Kim Howell dealing with cancer. Uh, her husband, Lewis, uh, his enlarged heart and breathing issues. Uh, Susan Sly, she had, uh, I'm assuming it was a major stroke, but her carotid arteries and migraines and alethia. Got a good report. Talked to Dave last Monday, and uh, he is doing well, and alethia is now more on a maintenance chemo, and so a lot of times she does not have to be in the hospital to do the chemo treatments, and that's a tremendous blessing. Alethia is, I think, seven now. 
And then, of course, John McLennan's brother. We're praying for his brother, Alan, who has cancer. He is lost and is, is hostile toward God, but praying that God will use the cancer to turn his heart to the Lord there in Scotland. So just some thoughts, updates on the missionaries there. If we go back to uh, the front page, give you an update on Jim Zorick. Uh, found out through his wife last Saturday that he'd been placed in the hospital with a blood clot and with pneumonia. And uh, he is now home, got to spend a little bit of time with he and his wife yesterday. So he is doing better, but he needs continued prayer as well. And then Vicki Hunterford, um, I, I will not try to pronounce the name of her disease, but one of the issues, and this is just one of them that she faces, she has a form of blood cancer. And uh, so today they had to take her to the hospital. Her blood gets thick because of the blood cancer and uh, had to treat her today. This happens every once in a while. So as you pray for the Hunterfords, they both have a lot of health issues. He will be having some work on his carotid arteries. He has about 80% blockage on one side, I think some blockage on the other side. And that's a major deal. And so they will be treating him, working on him here pretty soon and of course with his, her health issues as well. And then of course yesterday was a funeral for Pastor George Heitman, Bible Baptist Fellowship Church. I tell you what, it was a great service. You hate, hate to say that the funeral service is a great service, but it was almost like a camp meeting revival type atmosphere. It really was. It, it, was, it was fantastic. And uh, I wish, I wish uh, they would recorded it. I don't know if they did, but it would almost be worth just listening to um, just a tremendous service, and God worked through it. And so continue to pray for his wife, Patty. I mentioned to you that they, they were never able to have children, so she is basically now by herself. I'm sure her church family will do much to care for her, but Bible Baptist Fellowship Church is now without a pastor, and uh, right now it is very difficult uh, to get men into that position, very difficult to get men into the youth pastor position. So. Uh, really need to pray for Bible Baptist Fellowship Church as well. All right, we'll go ahead and open it up to any special requests that you might have, or maybe you have a praise, and a praise Lord, it, my wife is here tonight and doing much better and just improving every day. So praise Lord, she's able to be here tonight. Anything that you'd like to add, John? What's your mom's first name again? Patty. Of course, we have Mr. Fox on the prayer list. Is his hip uh, therapy going pretty well? Okay, so. so. Okay. All right, so pray for Josh flying down to Pensacola. Just out of curiosity, how many will be traveling uh, during Thanksgiving? Anybody traveling? Okay, one. Anybody else? Okay, we normally have, you know, a fair amount of people that travel next week, so those are traveling. My son, Corey, and his family uh, will be coming up from Louisville after his service on Sunday. They'll travel up, and we get to see them most of the week next week, so excited about that. My granddaughter, Savannah, she likes to text people. Of course, she can't understand any of it. And then she likes to push the button where, where it will voice record. And you can't really understand a whole lot of that either. But anyway, it, it, it was a lot of fun today. Uh, Darby? Okay. Okay. So remember Ainsley Keeney with that. And then Darby, uh, you know, I took his name off because I just figured his knee was doing better, but he's still having uh, issues with his leg, foot, and knee with the swelling. So keep praying for him because we should just add him back on with that. Anything else tonight, uh, brother?
you heard that uh, on Sunday he preached to the Shore Convention. Praise the Lord. That's good. Second generation South African that you guys had influence with, and praise the Lord for that. That you know, that's a lot of times when missionaries step away from a church. You hope the nationals will continue to work on, but I'm sure you've seen it where churches don't continue. So that's that has to be encouraging to you guys to see that continue on. Praise the Lord for that. Anything else? Any other praises or just another prayer request? Anything at all, Ashley? Yes. Mm, that's good. That is good. I I was really surprised when I heard that they and I I think um, walkers yeah. And it's a blessing to have that. Uh, Vern, you had your hand up too. Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, God's done a great work in your granddaughter. That is a tremendous blessing. And then, of course, you know, really uh, for Fred Hewitt and for Don Myers and for you all battling cancer, God's done a lot of nice things. I, I'll just put it that way. And we'll, we'll pray that God will work through those tests tomorrow, that you'll get good results. Uh, Don, you know, he had that struggle with uh, becoming very dehydrated and developed you know some issues because of that uh, I don't know if I told you maybe I did but uh, you know he got a good report last week he was all excited about it so it's just encouraging to hear those things praise the Lord for those things okay well, we'll go ahead and put our prayer list to the side and oh there is one I shouldn't I should have mentioned this this is important I was just handed this right before um, the service tonight there's a little boy by the name of Lincoln Friss, Friss or Fricks, it's F-R-I-X, Lincoln Fricks. So I'm not sure the pronunciation of his last name, but uh, I'll just read this to you. He's a four-year-old little boy with cerebral, cerebral palsy. They just diagnosed him with stage four kidney cancer. It has spread to his lungs, and so he starts chemotherapy this week. Just pray God will do a special work there for this little boy. I don't know anything about the family. Um, I don't know about their salvation. And, uh, this was given to me um, by Kara Gillespie, so just be in prayer for that little boy. All right, if you would take your Bibles tonight, we're going back to the book of Proverbs again. I really enjoyed this study, and I, I can't tell you when we'll stop this study, uh, but as long as we got something to give you, we'll continue on with it. Proverbs chapter 23 tonight, Proverbs chapter 23. We'll have a word of prayer together, and then we'll look at the scripture here. Father, I thank you again. There have been praises given tonight. But we're still a needy people, and I guess it will always be that way as long as we are in a sin-cursed world and in sin-cursed human bodies will always have needs and I 
No, you realize that, Father, you said you would supply all of our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We thank you that you do that, that you fulfill those truths. You know, whether it's monetary or emotional or physical need, whatever it may be, that you have a way of delivering people. You also have a perfect will. We recognize your sovereignty. Recognize, Father, that there are times that you do things that are not necessarily to our liking. Nevertheless, we yield to you because you are God and you know what's best. And yet, you tell us, just like the, uh, the widow woman who went to the unjust judge, she would continually badger him until he gave an answer. So, Father, thank you that you give us the privilege to come every Wednesday night and plead with you. And every day, individually, in our homes, in our private lives, we can plead with you. And you do not refuse to listen to us. You are open to our request. I do not know always what you will give in way of answer, but I do know you hear us. I do know that you love us. I do know that you care. And Father, I thank you for that truth. Tonight, we ask this. We ask you to teach us. Lord, just open again our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law. Do that here. Do that in the Awana ministry, the teen ministry, everything that's going on in this place. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read verses 17 through 19 here in Proverbs 23. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. If you were here this past Sunday morning, you heard me preach about having a teachable spirit. And the first point I brought up was this, that we need to have, and I talked about what a teachable spirit looks like, and we need, we need to have a look of fear. And as I explained that, the attitude of having the fear of the Lord in our life, that my attitude every day when I put my feet on the floor, get out of bed and put my feet on the floor, my attitude toward God should be, God, I do not want to go through this day without you. I do not want to attempt to live this day without you because your son said without me you can do nothing. So God I want you in control. God I want you to give me guidance. I have a fear of you, a reverence for you. I do not want to try to live this day without you. And yet you and I both know that there are many Christians who attempt to live life without him. We know that. But I don't have to be like that nor do you. We don't have to be that way. In the book of Proverbs, there are several statements about the fear of the Lord. And this is, I guess you would say, the main one we will look at tonight, that you and I as believers need to have a fear of the one that we now call Abba, the one that we call Daddy, the one we call Father. We need to have a reverential fear of the God that has saved us. We need that. In Proverbs chapter 23, these verses that we just looked at, just kind of sum it up here, just a, a simple look at these verses. Verse 17 again, let not thine heart envy sinners. So God says, don't envy sinners. Don't envy sinners. Instead, you notice what he says at the end of that verse, be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Don't envy sinners. Instead, I want you to fear the Lord. Now the question is why? Verse 18. Because surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Now I guess you can look at this verse in one of two ways. I'll, I'll look at it this way. There is an, an expected or a determined end both to your course in life, but also to the sinner. Also to the sinner. The Bible talks about how he will turn them into hell. They have an expected end. The sinner has an expected end. Now the joy is 
that you and I have the privilege of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people and seeing sinners turn from their wicked ways. And God says, if I'll turn from my wicked way, he'll hear from heaven and forgive. And I stand here, a sinner redeemed. And you sit here tonight, a sinner is redeemed. God has changed us. But not every sinner will turn. And they have an expected end. Just like you and I have an expected end. We will stand one day in heaven before the throne of God. We will walk up to the mansions that he's prepared for us. We will get a glorified body. All those things are the expected end to our existence, so to speak, as we go into eternity. A determined end, an expected end. And the expectation that a person who fears the Lord has is a good expectation. Would you not say that's true? Verse 18, or verse 19, he sums that thought up between this little passage here by saying, you need to hear this, my son, be wise and guide thine heart in the way. He said, this is the focus that you need to have. You need to fear the Lord. You need to fear him. Don't be looking over here at these sinners and envy them where they seem to be at. You need to fear me and keep yourself in that position all the day long. Envying sinners or envying the sinner's lifestyle is always detrimental to those who are supposed to be fearing the Lord. It's always detrimental to you and me who are supposed to be fearing the Lord. You start looking at the sinner. Here's a simple thought, and that's what this passage describes. Don't envy them. You say, well, it's, it's hard not to envy the sinner when you see all the advantages that they seem to have. And you look at verse 18 and you can say, I don't, I don't see the expected end for the sinner. I see Bill Gates and Robert Murdoch and Elon Musk and I see Mark Zuckerberg and Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos and all these people who have billions. They live the life of kings. They literally, and this is truth, they really control what goes on in this country and much of what goes around the world now. They dictate to our government. They dictate to the media what's going to be done. And we are under their kind of control. If you doubt that, just examine the life of Bill Gates. We talk about vaccines. We talk about, uh, you know, climate change, the things that are going on with the World Economic Forum and the involvement that these men have in these matters, and they control the masses, and we're part of the mass. We're part of that. And you look at their life and you say, man, oh man, Bill Gates, you know, look, he's bought up. And just another article this, this a few days, yesterday it was, about him purchasing all this farmland all over the United States, basically controlling, you know, much of the landmass of this country now. You know, it's just amazing what goes on. But you look at that and you say, I don't see their expected end. I mean, they're sinners, I thought. And listen, these people, most of them anyway, don't have a use for God. They don't have a use for God. Made me think about another passage and to help us kind of get a grasp of what God is saying, what Solomon was saying to his son, and what God is saying to you and me as his children. I want you to go back to Psalm 73. Go back to Psalm 73. Asaph, a Levite, He's a musician, by the way. By the way, they had professional choirs. They were well-trained. I was just reading today in uh, First Chronicles, and they were trained. In fact, it says they gave themselves to music. That, that was their focus as part of the Levitical ministry. Great deal of, of effort in uh, time and music. But anyway, uh, Asaph was part of that, but he also wrote a number of the Psalms and I want you to notice what he says here in Psalm 73, the first verse. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. All right, pause for a minute. Is that a true statement? Okay, yes. Well, there's one person that believes that. Okay, we know that to be a true statement. How many times have you heard maybe a preacher say, 
God is good all the time, and all the time, what? God is good. How many of you have ever heard somebody say that or a preacher say that? Uh, I was over at Bible Baptist Temple. This is several years ago. And the guy's up there preaching, and he said, God is good all the time, and all the time. And all the people said, God is good. You know, is that a true statement? And we would say, sure, that's a true statement. That's a true statement. That's what I'm supposed to say as a Christian. I am to say that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. That's what I'm supposed to say. So I'm going to follow the company line, and in front of all you, I'm going to say, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. That's theologically correct. I know that. And sometimes that's where it stops for believers. It's theological truth that has not penetrated the spirit or the, or the soul. Because we don't really feel like that. I know that's a true statement, but I don't really feel like that. Here's Asaph, and he is saying, I know the truth. I know the theological truth. Truly, truly now, God is good to Israel. Even to such are as of a clean heart. Listen, if you only have a clean heart, if you live a right life with God, if you'll be right with God, God will bless you. God will make life good for you. Is that not what we think? Is that not what we think? Okay. Verse 2. But, however, but as for me, and this may be true for all these other Christians, this may be true for all the other believers, but as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. In other words, you know, we are standing on the rock Christ Jesus. I'm on solid ground. Stand fast, therefore, you know. And that's true for all you guys, but it ain't true for me. Because I start looking around and I see what's going on. Man, I've, I've just about gone down for the count. That's what Asaph is literally saying. Now, I'm not going to, you know, go through this to a great deal of exegesis, if you want to put it that way, but, but I do think it's important we understand what he's saying. And we look at this, verse 4, for I was envious. What? I, I was envious. What did God say in verse 17 of Proverbs 23? Let not thine heart envy sinners. Here's Asaph. He is a great man of God, literally. He is a great man of God. God has let the Holy Spirit inspire him to write scripture. He ministers in the temple constantly. What did this great man of God say? I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I don't live like Bill Gates lives. I don't live like Warren Buffett lives or Rupert Murdoch or any of those other guys. I don't. I never will. You know, most of you, a lot of Americans now go from paycheck to paycheck. Savings, what is that? You know, paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, and you watch gas prices, and they're going to go up here soon, apparently. You look at the food prices. You look at, can you imagine what your energy bill is going to look like at the end of February, folks? We see all those things. We, we don't live like these guys. Lord, how is that fair? I'm the one who is faithful to you. I'm the one who trusts you. I'm the one who has a consistent prayer life. I tell people about Jesus. I try to keep my life clean. I try to keep a clean heart. God, how is this possible? How is it? How is it? And here is Asaph acknowledging in this psalm his heart. He doesn't say this was somebody else. He says, this was me. I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death. You know, bands, fetters, chains. There's, there's nothing like that. They got, they got a, in a sense, an easy life. When it comes to death, they just kind of slip out of eternity, and it's like, man. You know, they had, they had no, no grief, if you will. But their strength is firm. Up to the moment of their passing, they are not in trouble as other men. You know, it reminds me of what we're told in Scripture. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Man is born to trouble. That's what Job said. But these people, 
it appears anyway, as you look at these people, they don't, they don't have trouble. They're not going to struggle to pay their power bill. We are now just almost like getting bombarded now with people needing help. We've always helped a certain amount of people every month. We've done it for years and years and years, and now it's just coming in one after another. Like last week, I had a day where a number of people called. We, we need help. We, we can't make it, you know, this kind of stuff. Quite frankly, that's going to become more uh, a reality in the months ahead. Again, they're not in trouble like other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. If it's not one problem, it's another. If it's not one issue in life, it's another issue. Just like, like you're plagued, so to speak. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Boy, we could, we could wax eloquent on what we see going on in our society. Some of these people who dominate now our society have brought evil upon our society, and violence to men. It, it, I'll just throw this out. You hear this constant refrain, you know, it is, it is racist, it is unkind to think about putting a border wall up around Texas and Arizona to keep the illegal aliens from coming across, and those same people live in gated communities, walls in front of their homes. No one can get to them, but you know what? The, the hypocrisy that we see constantly. When you start looking at them, sometimes you get like Asaph. Verse seven, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They have more than heart could wish. I would imagine none of you can actually say that. Now, quite honestly, as the Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians chapter 4, to be content in whatsoever state I am. I know how to abound. Paul said, I also know how to be abased. I know how to be full. He said, I also know how to be hungry. And he said, in either position, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be content. In this very book of Proverbs, we'll see this later on, the cry to God is, give me contentment where I don't have too little and I curse you or too much and deny you. God, just give me what's contentment, if you will, in the things that I need. He goes on to say about these people, he said in verse 8, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They set their mouth, no notice this, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. You understand that many of these people I mentioned have no use for God and think you're a fool for believing in God. But you look at them and they got all kind of things. They got all kind of money. They got all kind of pleasures. And you say, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm serving God. I'm, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm getting hassled. And they're living the life of Riley. Doesn't, doesn't add up. Hey, listen, when God said, let not thine eyes or thine heart envy sinners, he meant it. Don't, don't let yourself get into this position. Asaph obviously let himself get into this position Verse 10, therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. In other words, for the believer, like Asaph, waters of affliction now occupy their life. And they say, how does God know? And where is the knowledge of the Most High? Hey, God, are you oblivious to what's going on? Don't you realize that it's the wicked who are being blessed? It's, the, it's those who don't love you and deny you that are seemingly benefiting all the time. And here I am serving you. I got all these problems, all these heartaches. That's where Asaph was at. Verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. That doesn't make sense. I should be the one. I, that's in, you know, what's amazing, this is an Old Testament economy passage, an Old Testament economy passage where God in blessing, it wasn't waiting for rewards in heaven, it was getting literal blessing on earth. The kingdom was earthly, not heavenly. And this man is saying, God, things aren't adding up. 
Think aren't, things aren't adding up. This is a sad verse, verse 13. Verily, I, had cl I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency for all the day long. You remember what he said? You are to fear God how much? All the day long in Proverbs 23. Here he said, all the day long instead of fearing God, I feel like I'm plagued. I'm chastened every morning. God, for me, I'm serving you in vain. I'm living for you in vain. You wonder why so many people walk away from God. You wonder our young people get so influenced by things and they see people with things pleasures and it's almost like the attitude well, how can God compete with that how can God compete with that and we watch young people step away from the ranks of the church or of just living for God because there's a mindset as they look at the world and envy it that the church can't compete with this. I know there's a danger and I'm well aware of it that we can become in order to keep our young people, we got to entertain them. We've got to have a building with, with you know, ping pong tables and foosball tables and we got to have all these things. What if, what if all those things were taken away? What if we took away the air conditioning? What if we took away carpet on the floor? Would you keep coming? Trying to rebuild a church down in Atlanta. We go out and people say, what do you have to offer our kids? The gospel? <laughs> you mean you don't have a well-developed program that you know we, every night of the week something's going on for our kids? Nah, sorry. We don't. We're trying. And I'm not opposed to those things. I, I understand that there is a need to minister. To, listen, they love to play games, and I don't think it's wrong for them to go over there and shoot a basketball or play volleyball. I, quite frankly, I love to do that kind of thing. You know, I, even at this age, I still like to do those kind of things. But the point is this. A lot of, a lot of young people just turn away because in their mind, church God just they can't compare it to what the world is offering. You, you have got a task on your hands to help keep your young people going toward the Lord. I don't, I don't envy any of you who have younger children. I do not envy you today over the kind of battles you face. I mean, it was bad enough when we were raising our kids. Now today, it's even more difficult. But with God, what? All things are possible. That can happen. So anyway, you look at this, and here is, here is Asaph, and he said, I've done this all in vain. I've served God in vain. Everything's vain. Now, brother, if the chapter ended there or the psalm ended there, that would be one, chap one psalm I would not want to read. Praise the Lord, it does not end there. Uh, just, well, we'll read verse 15 to 16. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. I mean, I shouldn't be saying this in front of other children of God. I shouldn't be complaining. I shouldn't be telling about how envious I am of the world and how disappointed I am with God and how I've given up on God and life as a Christian is vain. Life as a child of God is vain. I shouldn't be saying this, but, but that's the way I actually feel. But notice verse 17, it's one of the great verses in, in the, the book of Psalms. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. When I went into the sanctuary, and I grew up, you know, in a very large ministry, thousands were seated in that, and, and our pastor would always, not always, but often I would hear him refer to that as the sanctuary. And I've heard people say, you shouldn't call an auditorium in a church a sanctuary. That's not good. You shouldn't call it that. Well, whatever you want to call it. If you want to call it an auditorium, if you want to call it a sanctuary, I really don't care. But my point is this. Where does your mind go when you hear the word sanctuary? What do you think he's referring to? 
Yeah, the temple. That's, that's the automatic thought we go to. Just like if we talk about the sanctuary, people would think, well, he's talking about church. We're going to the sanctuary. Well, he means, he means the church where they're going to go to worship. And that, you know, that is obviously part of this. But that's not all of this. The word sanctuary means a sacred place. A sacred place, a holy place. There's a guy walking up the side of a mountain, has a bunch of sheep with him. He's sweating, laboring to get up this mountain. It's called Horeb. And he comes around a turn in the mountain and he sees this bush and it's on fire. And he's amazed. He's amazed. And he's thinking, I didn't see any thunderheads. I didn't hear any thunder. I didn't hear lightning strike. But that bush is on fire. He goes over to take a look at it. And he's expecting to see those leaves being burnt to a crisp and fluttering off into the wind. And he looks and it doesn't burn. The leaves are still green. And then he hears a voice. What did that voice say? Take off thy shoes, for the ground, ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. Holy. It's a sacred place. The sanctuary, which means a sacred place, a holy place, doesn't necessarily mean this building, this room. A sanctuary can be any place. It can be on the side of a mountain with a burning bush. It can be in your living room, your den, your bedroom, wherever you get alone with God. It becomes a sacred, it becomes a holy place. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood either end. Go over with me to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. This is kind of interesting. Isaiah chapter 8. Look at verses 13 and 14. God's people are in rebellion. So God makes this statement. He says, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Notice that. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Set him apart. And let him be your fear. Let him be your fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of your confidence. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of life. He said, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be, now notice this, he shall be for a sanctuary. And then the rest of the verse talks about those who refuse to follow him, he'll become a stumbling block and so forth. But he said, for those who choose to make God their fear, he becomes the sanctuary. That's why I go back to what I said Sunday morning. A teachable spirit begins with a look of fear. Fearing God, looking to him, say, God, I cannot make it through this day without you. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. <clears throat> Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace as we, as we sing often. The sanctuary. The church can be a sanctuary. I hope tonight you feel like this is a sacred place. It's a place where we get away from the world for just a little while on a Wednesday night. And we hear God's word, and we let it speak to us. He uses an instrument, a human instrument, as fallible as I am. He uses a human instrument to speak. He's using teachers all through this property to speak to children and teenagers. He uses us, but this place is like a sanctuary. And maybe tonight or tomorrow morning you get up and you, whether it's in your bedroom or at the living room, or maybe you go out to your garage, get away from all the noise in the house, and you, you just find a, a place to become a sacred place, a sanctuary where you get alone. But the Lord himself is a sanctuary. The Lord himself is a sanctuary. So when you look at this 73rd Psalm, he says, then understood I, and he goes in, I guess for time's sake, I better not do this, but when you read the next seven or eight verses, he talks about the fate of the wicked. And as he makes God the sanctuary, as he gets his eyes back on God, as he attends the temple and hears the teaching of God's word, of course, he had access to the books of Moses like others in his, his homeland did not have because he lives at the temple complex for part of the year anyway. He, he's constantly around this, so he is, he's able to turn his eyes back toward the Lord 
And when he does, he said, I, I understand now, God. Because he goes on to that and says, these people will be quickly destroyed. And that, that is literally true. You and I can envy a guy like a, a Jeff Bezos or a Bill Gates and, you know, envy over their money and all the pleasures that they have. But, brother, there's going to come a sudden stop to their life. It's going to be called death. And in hell, they lifted up their eyes, being in torment. Don't you forget that. That's not the expected end that I want. And praise the Lord, I will not have that. I will open my eyes in heaven. And more than likely, the first sight that I will see is the one who gave his life for me. I'll see him. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. I'll take that. I'll take a little bit of rough life here if, if God requires that of me to have the joy of eternity in heaven compared to having it all here on earth and then waking up with nothing in the pits of hell. That is not a choice. That's a no-brainer. Amen? Amen? That's a no-brainer. He said, you keep your eyes on the Lord. You learn to fear the Lord. You learn to fear the Lord. Now, back in Proverbs, and we got about six minutes just kind of go through these quickly. I mentioned that there are several places in the Proverbs that talks about the fear of the Lord. I want you to go to Proverbs 14, verse 26. Proverbs 14, verse 26. And there, in the 26th verse of that chapter, he says, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. His children shall have a place of refuge. Now, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but I'm going to read to you a verse out of Ezekiel, chapter 11, verse 16. Chapter 11, verse 16 of Ezekiel. And it says, and when the, oops, wrong chapter. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, Israel's rebellion, God sending him into captivity, he's referring to that. Yet, now listen to this, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. God says, you know what, even when I have to discipline you, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, okay? All right, there are times where God has in my life had to discipline me because of my rebellion. God says, even in that place, he says to his people, even when you're in Babylon or in Assyria, if you turn to me, even in the midst of all that suffering and judgment that I bring you, I'll, I'll be a little sanctuary to you. I'll be a sacred place that you can come and you can come and I will be your sanctuary. You don't have the temple because that's been destroyed. You don't have your synagogues anymore because they've all been leveled. But you have me. So when you find yourself, even at a time where you might say, you know, I, I've, I've brought a lot of this on me because I, I backslid, I, I got out of God's will, I, I refused to obey him, and now I'm suffering the consequences of it. Okay, God says, I still want to be your sanctuary. Still want to be your sanctuary. I think that's a great verse. I think that's, that's a tremendous thought. He still wants to be your sanctuary. And he says this, when you learn to fear the Lord, he said, I will be your Confidence, your strong confidence, and your refuge. I like that God's my refuge. I like that. Look at Proverbs 14, the next verse, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. You know what else the fear of the Lord is? It's not only strong confidence and a refuge, it is a fountain of life. That's a tremendous thought. Now, I think about this, one of my favorite psalms and a psalm I memorized when Chris was going through all those things many, many years ago, Psalm 91, and it's something I still go back to the Lord with every day. In the second verse, he says, I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. He is my refuge. He also says in the next verse, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He said, I'm going to deliver you from those things. Now look again at that verse, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. 
when you let the Lord become your fear, he said, I'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler. The fowler kind of means like a bird catcher or like, you know, I, you know, I trap muskrat and things like that. You, you get in some of those traps, it breaks your neck instantly. It, it, the, the, the snare is a death instrument. It's a death instrument. And Satan would destroy you if he could. And if he can't destroy you spiritually, he will destroy your reputation. He'll destroy your confidence in God. And he says, listen, God wants to be, if you will fear me, I will be a fountain of life to you. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. To have the fear of the Lord brings you strong confidence, brings a place of refuge, it's a fountain of life, and it's a means to depart, listen, it's a means to depart from evil. Because once I give my life over to evil, I might end up like Ananias and Sapphira. I don't question that Ananias and Sapphira were truly believers, but when God judged him, he killed them because of their sin. There are different places in the New Testament where it talks about God taking the life of Christians because of their rebellion. The fear of the Lord, if we stay in the fear of the Lord, if our focus is on the fear of the Lord, it will help us to depart, not only from committing evil, but from the acts of evil, if you will. And then Proverbs 19.23. Proverbs 19.23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall, never, he shall not be visited with evil. God's judgment will not come upon those who remain in the fear of the Lord. But I notice that word, satisfied. The fear of the Lord, when you have it, satisfies you. When, when I do keep my eyes on the Lord like, I'm, like I should, and I don't get lured by envy after those who have, you know, financially much or, you know, in pleasures much, when I keep my eyes on the Lord, you know what I find? I find he satisfies. I don't need millions. I don't need a mansion. I mean, I already got one. I got it in heaven. I know that. That's what we're told in John chapter 3 or John chapter 14. I, I know that, but you know what? I don't need those things right now. It's like the book of James says, wanting nothing more. As long as I have him, I don't need anything else. You know what? I'm not going to stand here and tell you that there are not times I look at something and say, yeah, I'd like to have that. I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. When I keep my eyes on the Lord like I should, God does bring a sense of satisfaction and condemn what I have. Especially when I hear people who have a lot and their, their homes are a wreck, they're a mess. And you hear people who take their lives because even though they had millions or billions of dollars, that didn't bring them happiness. Any wealthy man will tell you that, that it doesn't bring you happiness. Maybe nice to have, but it doesn't bring happiness. This satisfies the fear of the Lord. The last verse we'll look at tonight is back at verse, or chapter 15 and the 16th verse. This is just kind of the sum of this total tonight. Better is a little, <clears throat> excuse me, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. I'm okay with not being like Jeff Bezos or Rupert Murdoch or Bill Gates. I'm okay with that. I don't need billions. I don't need millions. I got the Lord. And I just, I just need to keep my eyes on him, not let myself envy, get my heart all stirred up for something that is, in God's eyes, worthless, worthless. People get all stirred up for things, and they're really, in God's eyes, worthless. And the longer I live, 
the more worthless things become to me too. I really do. I bet that's true for you too. If you, if you love the Lord and the longer you live as a Christian, I bet that's true in your heart. The more those things are of, of no importance, just not. I like that. I like what the, the Proverbs has to say about the fear of the Lord. I, I hope that's been an encouragement tonight to you. Father, I thank you for your word. Uh, I, there is no book in the Bible that's not very interesting and a great blessing. But this is the book of wisdom, and it has insight for us that can certainly help us in a very practical way. And this is in, in, though this is a spiritual thought, this is also a very practical thing, Lord, to keep us from becoming envious and discouraged and living a life as though Christianity is vain. Lord, I thank you for what you've taught us in this book. Help us to continue to take advantage of it. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll get a chance to go to prayer tonight. And plenty of things to pray about. Plenty of things to praise the Lord about, too. So you get a chance to go to prayer now.